The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome to today's V Brownback. My name's Frank, and with me today I have Chris, who's going to take us on a quick tour through Kubernetes. Um, the session is titled the VMware Admins Ticket on Board the DevOps um, Voyage, I guess in English. Um, as always, if you want to get in touch, you can tweet us at the at the Brownback uh, handle. Um, you can use the Twitter hashtag uh, hashtag the Brownback, or use the chat down below um, to to ask any questions to the presenters. If you do want to present yourself, uh, feel free to get in touch as well. We run these sessions regularly on a Tuesday, 7 p.m. Um, British Standard Time. Uh, if that time does not suit you, we are more than happy to make any accommodations as well. And with that, I'd say it's over to you, Chris. I'll give you the presenter rights. Okay, thanks for that. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'll just set this up. Um, can you see that? Yes. Cool. Let's go into presenter mode. Does that look good? That looks perfect. Excellent. Uh, thanks for having me on. Um, it's my your first time presenting, so hopefully it'll be okay. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm Chris Porter. You can find me uh, on the web at Upright Vinyl on Twitter and my blog on uprightvinyl.co.uk. Um, I work as uh, an infrastructure architect for a bank here in London. Um, and uh, recently, the last month or so, I've started sort of playing with uh, Kubernetes. We've seen um, some desire to, to look at this kind of technology. So um, we're trying to get ahead of it in the bank or, or, or catch up, as it were. Um, and I thought kind of that would be a useful topic to um, to share what I've learned. I'm by no means uh, an expert or have um, all the answers on this, but uh, as I say, I thought it'd be interesting to um, kind of talk through what I've learned and, and how I think it's relevant to um, us as, so uh, well, as VMware admins. You, you, you're actually using containers in a bank. Um, aren't you stuck to mainframes in Java? And Internet <laughs> Explorer 6? <laughs> Yes, well, we as a bank um, tend to do lots and lots of different things. So we have that full scale of mainframe to uh, people want to do sort of bleeding edge. So um, yeah, we're kind of trying to keep up with those guys. There's not really anything I think running in containers at the moment sort of production wise, but uh, we're seeing more and more people ask for it. Uh, so um, yeah, I'll kind of touch on it a bit later on, but I think this is, um, being able to answer when people want to want to have an idea of how they might run containers even to develop on it um so yeah that's um yeah we're not we're not quite that screaming edge but there are some banks that are so okay cool and one more question that twitter hashtag or that website name i assume you are a music fan then um, I, I am, but that, that just comes from sort of all of us are needing an interesting handle many years ago. And uh, yeah, that's from a, um, an old vinyl player that I picked up at a car boot sale that um, actually plays vinyl upright. Um, so if you're interested in that, try and find me in person and I can discuss it more. But it's a really cool bit of technology that I still still have, actually. So, uh, yeah, it's kind of kind of kind of mad. And it kind of suited as a useful handle, be a bit different, I guess, in a domain name that was that was my name. Uh, Chris Porter is uh, fairly um, fairly hard to get hold of any domain of that. So uh, yeah, it kind of helps in having something unique. Cool. So yeah, so um, just in terms of an agenda, I'll just uh, give a, an overview of Kubernetes and, and kind of the history. We'll talk about kind of a very high level of some of the architecture components, um, how it's kind of relevant on what VMware are doing in this space. Um, kind of talk touch on that DevOps voyage piece, um, a slightly sort of silly and bombastic title, but uh, why not? And, uh, and then talk about if you're interested, what you might want to do uh, next to kind of start playing with, with Kubernetes kind of based on, on what I've been playing with in the past. So yeah, let's crack on. Um, 
So just to start things off, um, any discussion around, I think, Kubernetes, Docker and containers, I think it needs some pictures of containers. So literally, here is a container. Um, and it's kind of the story of why you might be interested in or, or why you have the desire to put Kubernetes in. Um, I think there's lots of developers now, and, and I play with it myself as well, that have um, developed or, or played with or downloaded a container and run Docker on their laptop. Um, and they might sort of put that on a server as, and, and sort of start serving that as a, an application. Um, and then they might split that out into a few containers, maybe a, a web server, Nginx, um, and then sort of MySQLs, Redis, various different components in different containers. So you start to sort of see um, something like this with, with quite a few containers uh, all running on a, on a single host. Um, or, or, or multiple hosts um, and with, this is the typical kind of where we start to see containers in the VMware world where someone asks for a very big uh, Linux host and uh, then ends up we, we wonder what it's doing um, and they've decided they're going to run lots and lots and lots of containers on that system um, but then very quickly uh, in an environment um, when you're splitting up an application I think you can suddenly get something like this and uh, that's if you're just running lots of containers along lots of hosts that can become very difficult uh, or almost impossible to manage and scale and I think people hit a roadblock at this point so kind of Kubernetes I, I quite like this um, uh, quote that I've picked up from a VMware job advert that they're currently advertising for a line manager uh, to help with Kubernetes um, and kind of just to summarize they're basically saying here they want to change um, the way that customers manage applications rather than being at a VM or a VM at a time or a container at a time this is looking at distributing uh, dis managing whole distributed applications rather than dealing with the individual parts of them and that's kind of where I think Kubernetes comes into play so where has Kubernetes come from? Um, it's got a, a, a good a heritage, as it were. Its predecessor was um, Google's Borg system. Um, now, Google haven't actually migrated away from using Borg. So Borg is their kind of secret source internally that they, they use to run things like YouTube, Google Search, these pieces, um, Gmail. And by some reports, it runs somewhere up. 90% and above of Google's um, actual infrastructure. So um, it's got a very rich heritage, a lot, a lot of obviously heavy workloads running on, on Borg and the guys at uh, Google decided um, they wanted to open source or, or, or build a next version of Borg with basically the learnings they'd had from the previous ver from from Borg itself into Kubernetes. Um, and so and they wanted to do that to help drive adoption of their Google Cloud platform. So they um, developed uh, Kubernetes and in 2015 um, it was released as version 1.0 and it was open source and it was donated to the Linux Foundation. Um, at that time the Linux Foundation formed the Cloud Native Compute Foundation or the CNCF to look after sort of containers in the Linux world um, and so uh, Kubernetes is kind of looked after by the CNCF which was also formed in 2015. Um, and if you look on the right hand side of this, this uh, slide you can see that the, there is a huge number of very large enterprise companies that are platinum members of the CNCF. I, I, I don't think really, apart from maybe HP, there's any big players there that aren't involved in this. And from the kind of very new and bleeding edge, like things like Docker, uh, Mesosphere and things like that, to the very old uh, vanguards of enterprise IT and the, the oracles, um, and, and Dell, I guess, as well. So, and then you've got people like AWS and Azure. So there's a lot of traction and a lot of support and all of these people are developing and contributing into Kubernetes. Um, and in Kubernetes, there's a new version every three months. Um, and currently they're at version 1.10, which was uh, uh, released, um, I think last month. So currently, I think the current version is 1.10.5. So just a couple, couple of examples of people that are using uh, Kubernetes and using it in production. So touching on a bank there, so Monzo are a big bank in, in the UK. Um, and a couple of weeks ago, they crossed the threshold of having um, half a million current accounts and banking accounts, and they're all running on Kubernetes, which is running on AWS. Um, so that's direct debits, um, payments, people having salaries and things paid into them. Um, and I actually use them for my banking. They're a really good forward-thinking bank. 
Um, and yeah, if you go and look them up, there's lots of, uh, they're very open about what they're doing and how they're doing this. Um, if you look at someone like CERN, uh, they have um, over 200 clusters on Kubernetes uh, running on top of uh, OpenStack. Um, I couldn't find a good logo for CERN, so I've ended up with just a picture of the, uh, the Large Hadron Collider there. So, so I think that was as good as anything. And then also another company, JD.com, they're, they're a massive um, a retailer in China. Um, if you look at the last slide, they're actually a platinum member of the CNCF. So for, for a customer or, or, or a user, that's, that's quite significant. Um, it shows their sort of buy into Kubernetes and they um, have some very large clusters, some of them up, uh, running up to 5,000 nodes. If you think of node as a, basically a server or a VM, that's, that's some fairly significant clusters and, and things they're running. So some examples of this isn't just people playing with it or it's in a beta or alpha, this is um, um, production and being tested um, and, and used by some fairly large organizations for some fairly significant workloads. Um, so just that's a very brief look at the overview and background of uh, Kubernetes um, and sort of to kind of move on to maybe some of the, the architecture pieces at a high level. Um, so Kubernetes um, kind of has um, a couple of core elements and I think this is useful. We'll, we'll step through and kind of um, open up a couple of these um, areas just to show um, what's kind of inside these, these um, components. I think this is useful to understand, to look at all the different solutions out there, whether um, it's a hosted solution, whether it's something you're trying to run on-prem, what bits you might use and um, utilize, whether you're gonna build it yourself or, or use maybe Amazon's uh, service and the difference between spinning up Kubernetes on top of say Amazon EC2 or um, uh, spinning up uh, it using Amazon's EKS, their hosted Kubernetes service. Um, so that's kind of the difference of what you're getting there from those different services. Um, as a sort of an end user or um, so you've got operators and developers, they kind of tend to interact with the, the master component. Um, and then as an app user, you're hitting the applications running on the workers. Um, and then the master is storing um, uh, sort of state they're using as data sources on etcd which is a key value pair um, kind of think like kind of database in a way um, and the way that you kind of interact with the master and you'll see this a lot is using kube control or um, directly or um, using kube control to deploy um, yaml files into the the master to build uh, or deploy things into this environment um, kind of uh, yeah, just kind of touching on that. So the, the master and etcd and the components within the master, they're kind of considered the, the Kubernetes control plane. Um, and then the workers are kind of the worker nodes where, where applications are actually deployed and running. So if you kind of open up the, the master, um, there's kind of four key components running in here. You've got the Kube uh, API server. So this is actually where the operator, those developers, that's the API, and that's where everything interacts. But it's also interesting, the Kubernetes architecture is um, very much that everything goes through the front door. So all these other components will also interact with the same uh, uh, API as well. Um, uh, and you've got the Kube uh, scheduler. So that's um, looking at um, new deployments and then scheduling them onto workers. So that's um, putting your workloads onto those workers. And then you've got these two controllers, um, the Kube Controller Manager and the Cloud Controller Manager. Um, the Cloud Controller Manager is a fairly new development and that is splitting out, connecting to third party services like say AWS's load balances from being in the core uh, Kube Controller to being a separate piece. And that is a, a move to allow um, third parties to develop at a different pace than being uh, as part of the main uh, Kubernetes project. Um, and the Kube controllers, they, they run on uh, control loops. So they're constantly watching um, the cluster and um, correcting things. So if a, um, a worker dies, then they will take corrective action to spin up components of your Kubernetes cluster um, in other places. And they use the scheduler to deploy those things, but they're, they're watching the worker and they communicate um, through the API through to the, the workers to see what, what's going on on the, on the worker nodes. Um, 
if you're looking at the worker nodes, this is actually where your applications are going to run. Uh, the first component on there is the kubelet, um, and that kubelet is the kind of Kubernetes agent, so that connects from the worker um, into the master. Um, you have the container runtime, which typically is Docker, but is now is um, where Docker have separated out their runtime to be container D. Um, that is running your containers um, on your worker, and the containers will run in in pods. So the kind of that this uh, concept of an atomic piece of compute um, in a VM where well-being a VM in the Kubernetes world that's considered a pod and that could be one or more containers running in a pod um, and going back to that kind of that YAML file that you would deploy um, the simplest thing you can pretty much do in that to to deploy um, a workload into Kubernetes is to write that manifest file saying I want a pod to run and in that pod you define the containers that you want to run within that pod and you would say go off to this container registry um, and, and and run this this container um, and pods are uh, share a namespace they share volumes they share IP so there if you want to put multiple containers in a, in a pod they are for very tightly coupled uh, containers um, typically you would start to separate containers out into into maybe one per pod um, but yeah I mean a good example of multiple containers in a pod that's often cited is the idea of if you have a container that is um, watching a github repository to pull some files or from from that um, github and then you want to share that out internally um, you would then have a container doing that job to watch a github repository and pull things in and then a separate container sharing that out running nginx to share that out internally and they would share a volume um, and so they would perhaps be then put in the same pod um, because that is almost considered one um, workload and if that were to die you're not uh, break anything else um, but yeah huge area to kind of explore and understand um, so yeah that's very briefly touching on the architecture um, um, and yeah just kind of move on to um, what VMware have, uh, are doing this space uh, I don't know if there's any um, any questions at all or I'll just just move on not so far feel free to move on okay and I'm hoping cool. you're covering today's news as well <laughs> Yes, yeah, I have uh, got something in there. Uh, hopefully we're talking about the same thing. So, uh, yeah. Um, so just to start with VMware, um, if you go and search for VMware and deploying on-prem um, Kubernetes, um, very quickly you'll come across this vSphere Cloud Provider. Um, and I think what I can found confusing about the vSphere Cloud Provider is the use of Cloud Provider as a term within Kubernetes, and that can mean very different things with in the environment and uh, well with, when we're talking about cloud providers we might typically think that's something like a aws or azure um, cloud providers are a construct within kubernetes to allow you to connect to third, third party systems um, so the vSphere cloud provider at uh, the moment all, all that's providing or say all that's providing there's a, there's a lot it's doing but it's it's providing persistent storage into a kubernetes environment running on vSphere um, so I think that's that's good to put that in context and understand. And you're not looking at the vSphere Cloud Provider and this in particular component that VMware are working on to try and spin up Kubernetes uh, on on your on cluster or, or provide you with a uh, a vSphere Cloud, as it were. So um, what the vSphere Cloud Provider does is um, plugging into Kubernetes and providing um, persistent volumes so that you can utilize vSAN um, or VMFS uh, or NFS uh, data stores um, to provide volumes that can be persistent for stateful applications uh, that are running on Kubernetes. Um, persistent volumes are uh, a common concept within Kubernetes, so there are a number of different ways you can provide this. Um, that's not something that's unique to vSphere, but this piece is, is allowing you to use um, vSphere sort of native storage as as to provide that that persistency into a Kubernetes um, clusters and that that will that's something the volumes are something you define within that sort of YAML man manifest and then you define those volumes and then you connect those volumes uh, by um, mounting them into pods um, within uh, the cluster. So yeah, just kind of covering um, off. So they're, they're only covering volumes only at the moment. There's also work going on to um, look at um, host affinity and anti-affinity. So at the moment, just um, 
there's no kind of concept that Kubernetes recognizes of when you're spinning up separate pods and you say, I want to separate, um, uh, or I want to, to spin up multiple pods of uh, an application uh, across uh, multiple nodes, um, they could all just end up on the same uh, ESXi host. Um, so there's work going on about how you would tag um, hosts and bubble that up into, um, and so that Kubernetes can understand that. And there's also currently work going on to split the vSphere Cloud Provider into a separate repository. If you looked at the vSphere Cloud Provider, the new repository that's there, that's directly under the Kubernetes uh, organization in GitHub, um, a couple of weeks ago, there was pretty much nothing there because they, they emptied that out because at the moment they're, they're following that split of, uh, was talked about earlier about that cloud um, uh, controller um, being separated out and being put into a separate repository so they can develop at their own pace. So that's quite interesting seeing that work going on in the documentation and how that's changing at the moment. Um, so I thought I'd just cover that off about because that was something I found I found straight away and it kind of confused me um, what this kind of how this is relevant. Um, so if you're trying to look at this kind of Kubernetes on vSphere, there's a number of ways of doing it. Um, so you can go and do this from scratch. You can spin up some uh, Linux hosts. You can pull down all of the separate um, containers and binaries. Um, you can set up certificates and things. Um, it's a lot of work. Um, I think, and I'll touch on it, there's a link for how you would do that uh, later on. And I think that's good to learn about the components within Kubernetes, but in terms of something that is scalable and sustainable in terms of upgrades and day two piece um, I'm not sure that's that's necessarily a good place to, to be um, there's a number of tools from the Kubernetes um, organization itself that um, helps with this so one of them is um, uh, kube admin so this still relies on you having some Linux hosts spun up but will build all the certificates pull the images um, uh, create the 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 sort of uh, the PKI infrastructure within Kubernetes and do all that for you um, and then we'll spit out a string that you can then run on uh, other nodes to connect them in and make them run as part of, of a Kubernetes cluster. Um, building on, on Kube Admin is COPS. So COPS is um, uses Kube Admin but is also aware of the infrastructure so it's actually going to spin you up those um, servers themselves and um, install the Kubernetes components and connect them into a cluster so run the infrastructure piece as well. Um, COPS at the moment is um, generally available or sort of fully supported in AWS. Um, it's in beta for uh, spinning up in Google and it's in alpha phase for um, vSphere support. Um, so that and they they develop uh, because they need to have that kind of native interaction with those um, those infrastructure p um, um, providers. Then there's a lot more work that goes into it to to bring those up to to full availability. Um, and then there's another tool called Kubernetes Anywhere, um, which are, seems to be kind of um, gathering a bit of dust and um, I'm not quite bot got to the bottom of it yet. It has been recommended as a good way to spin up Kubernetes on vSphere, but for example, they haven't updated their README past uh, supporting 1.7 for Kubernetes. Considering 1.10 now, that's actually um, quite a few months old. Um, so I'm wondering if there's, the people have moved on to other bits there, but uh, certainly have a look at Kube, at Kube Admin um, and we'll touch on some of the other ways of doing things. Um, I've used Rancher in the past, so as of um, last month, they uh, announced general availability of Rancher 2.0, which um, now Rancher runs on and will spin you up a Kubernetes cluster as their native way of doing container scheduling. Um, that integrates quite nicely directly with vSphere, and this is a really quick way actually to get um, something up and interact directly with vCenter and get it spinning up the nodes for you. Um, and you can get that done quite quickly and, and see a Kubernetes cluster and, and get a GUI on top of that of how you might manage that. Um, I'll expand it a little bit more in the next slide, but um, the, the big piece that you find a lot if you're looking on the web um, in the last few months really is around um, VMware and, and uh, containers on vSphere environments is Pivotal Container Services or PKS. Um, so that's really where VMware along with Pivotal and also with Google are putting a lot of uh, effort into running you an enterprise grade uh, Kubernetes service on-prem and also on uh, directly on GCP. Um, and uh, yeah, I've got the next slide. I'll, I'll expand a little bit about the components of PKS. And then uh, announced today is um, VMware's Kubernetes service. So this is actually running you Kubernetes to kind of um, 
in a similar way to you can go out to Google or Azure or Amazon and go and get a Kubernetes managed service. So they will run that control plane for you. Um, VMware have just announced this today, their Kubernetes service. Um, and that's in beta, so you can go go and search for that and um, sign up and have a have a play. I haven't, um, it, yeah, literally, I think that was only announced a few hours ago. So it'll be interesting to see how their so the initial availability is on AWS, um, and they 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 stated they'll they'll uh, support uh, other clouds in the future. It'd be interesting to see how that um, compares to PKS going directly out to GC, GCE. Um, so that could run Kubernetes for you, although you'd need to run PK, PKS on prem, um, and how it, that can compares to Google's native Kubernetes engine or, or GKE um, and, and uh, Amazon's uh, EKS. So that'll, that'll be interesting. But um, yeah, all, all of this is uh, really interesting to watch. There's lots of developments as that is uh, tantamount to, to show you. So just on PKS itself. So uh, PKS is building on the um, uh, a number of elements from both Kubernetes, um, from Pivotal, and from VMware. Um, so the, the key piece um, in PKS um, that Pivotal are bringing here is, um, is Bosch. Um, so Bosch has been around for, uh, for a while now, and it's what Pivotal and their um, Cloud Foundry is kind of built on top of. And Bosch is an orchestrator for deploying infrastructure, kind of abstracting the infrastructure from services you'd want to deploy on top. So in this example, um, the PKS kind of control plane um, communicates with Bosch and says, I want to spin up a Kubernetes cluster. And then Bosch com communicates with the underlying infrastructure to spin that up and uh, manage that. So it's kind of, uh, we'll, we'll look at the Kubernetes master, that master and etcd that that control plane and also if those fail it will it will spin those up and replace replace those as well and keep them highly available um and bosch also integrates with um in in pks integrates with nsxt so that brings you really rich um networking um, um micro segmentation and security into a kubernetes environment and especially if you're already running nsx and nsxt on premises uh, uh, um, then this will really uh give you um an enterprise kind of class networking in the Kubernetes environment. And also what VMware are bringing as well as their, their Harbor container registry. So that gives you some enterprise capabilities in a container registry, things like RBAC um, uh, scanning through the Claire vulnerability service. So when you upload containers, um, they will be scanned for vulnerabilities and, and um, you can set policies of whether they're made available or not. Um, and then this all also integrates with GCP to spin these kind of uh, this on uh, up in Google's cloud and then manage it all from the same uh, control plane, basically. Um, yes, um, and lastly, um, just to cover this off, there's a really interesting piece called Virtual Kubelet, um, which uh, VMware are doing some work around to integrate with uh, VIC or vSphere Integrated Containers. The Virtual Kubelet is um, a kind of a proxy. So where we talked earlier in that the architecture piece around the kubelet being the agent on the worker node that the masters communicate with um, to distribute um, uh, deployments, then the virtual kubelet makes the master think it's communicating with a node, but actually it's communicating with some other uh, uh, abstracted infrastructure underneath. Um, so in this example, this is vSphere integrated containers, and, and this screenshot was taken a couple of weeks ago, but as you can see here, the idea is that when you spin up uh, vSphere integrated containers alongside the Docker capabilities that has, so you get a vSphere cluster, you, you add in vSphere integrated containers, you can integrate, you can communicate with sort of almost vCenter, but with Docker commands and spin up containers as if that's a Docker uh, container host, um, when actually that's just being backed by your vSphere environment, then Kubernetes will be able to plug into that. So you spin up a master uh, and um, NCD, uh, that master control plane, but then plug this in via the virtual kubelet into Vic and spin up containers. I think this would be really interesting to get uh, Kubernetes into something that's highly scalable and visible and manageable within a vSphere environment. So it'd be interesting to, to watch how this develops. 
and that was the latest news that I had. And obviously, the, as of today, there's, there's the VMware Kubernetes uh, service as well, even, even newer. Yep, um, that's what I was referring to. <laughs> good. Okay, we're on the same page. Excellent, excellent. I was hoping there wasn't something else as well, which is always interesting. But uh, yeah, uh, apologies for the numbering. I've clearly added a section here, and these are one behind what the agenda has. But anyway, so they're, they're kind of, uh, I think they had two number twos. So yeah, so that's kind of the, so we've been through the overview and the architecture at a very high level and how VMware, um, what VMware are doing. And I kind of wanted to talk about why this is relevant to VMware um, uh, administrators um, and how this sort of ties into this um, uh, ideas of DevOps uh, concepts and, and kind of talk a little bit around DevOps. So it's a short word, but it's, um, it's a big topic. Um, and kind of just before touching on maybe the more serious thing, I, I thought uh, I'd uh, quote this from uh, DevOps Borat uh, on Twitter. He said, to make errors human, but to propagate that error to all server in automatic ways is DevOps, which I, I, amuses me. Um, but yeah, so I, I really like this book and I really recommend running the DevOps uh, handbook, reading this book. Um, it's written by pretty much the luminaries of the um, uh, DevOps world, the, the, some of the guys that coined the term and, and wrote things like the Phoenix Project. Uh, they don't really necessarily go out and define DevOps in this book. But one of the quotes they have here is where they've stated um, it's where small teams are able to quickly and independently develop, test and deploy code and value quickly, safely, securely and reliably to customers. Um, and I think that in essence, that's kind of where rather than DevOps being a team or a set of tools, it's this this idea of working in a better way, uh, trying to uh, um, not be constrained by monolithic apps that you really couldn't develop and add new features to and there's a six months trail to add things it's it's working in a way that you can uh if a new feature is requested or someone comes up with an idea you can develop that very quickly but in a way that is scalable and certainly for enterprise customers uh, secure as well and so devops i think is it will becomes tools and becomes teams about how to do that but i think in essence there is that that idea um throughout um the 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 devops in terms of a culture piece um so this is kind of where well, I talk all of that and talk about the, the, this, these high level kind of concepts. And that's great. But I think as a VMware admin, kind of, uh, I think certainly myself as well, you kind of feel um, as an admin, you might be left out of that kind of shiny DevOps world. You've got all these people and these teams talking about doing this and running these things, but you're still as an admin or an architect developing vSphere clusters and people are just putting these things on top of it and it's kind of flying by and you're you maybe not getting involved in that. And you know, this idea of CI, C D and pipelines, continuous deployment, where where do you fit into that world? Um, and you, you get this idea touched on at the beginning in terms of uh, developers, you might kind of see it as they start to ask for large container hosts or ca how can I run containers, um, but you, you're kind of abstracted from it. Um, and I think, I, I really think uh, Kubernetes excites me because that is a way to kind of go, actually, I've got a way of being really relevant in this world, really um, having an answer to how do I run containers and how do I run them in a fashion that the enterprise can get comfortable with. Um, and how can I run them on-prem or give on-prem an option that is just as scalable, um, maybe not that elastically scale, but um, it's certainly across multiple nodes um, and, and can be interacted with in exactly the same way as a cloud service. And I think Kubernetes is, is uh, key to that. And I think that's why it's um, something that uh, VMware admins should really be investing time in and looking into. I think one of the other key things around Kubernetes and why it's really interesting uh, for development teams as well is it has a certain amount of default patterns as part of Kubernetes. Whereas I think in the past people might have looked at this kind of DevOps way of thinking and, and tried to get there one step at a time and work out how to do that. Um, but while bringing perhaps some of the um, bad practices in bad ways of working along with them and, and, and sort of tripping over that uh, whilst they try and balance um, um, trying to work in, in such a way 
whilst also um, trying to bring in the old world. Within Kubernetes, you're kind of forced to do things in a, in a much better way that supports this sort of DevOps idea. Um, for a start, everything is pretty much immutable. So the idea that you might SSH into something and tweak things and change things, you might do that in a, in a, in a pod, but uh, a pod, if it dies, then you're not, um, it's not going to be restarted like a VM. There's no state that's stored. Um, so that pod just gets the the um, master and the control plane will look at the workers. And if a worker fails, it will get out of the data store um, what the configuration was for that um, or the nodes that were on that, that worker that failed or the pods that were on that worker that failed and then just spin them up uh, elsewhere, completely afresh, putting in those containers and starting them up afresh. So you have to build things to be stateless. Um, as you're using YAML files and you're deploying this, you're using infrastructure as, as code. Um, there are various dashboards and UIs, but they tend to be more about metrics and looking at the system rather than tweaking things. So you're enforcing that pattern. There's rich support in Terraform for Kubernetes, things like that. There's um, lots of support uh, for Ansible, Puppet. Uh, so you're kind of, this is an opportunity, you're building an environment for, from scratch to really build it from the ground up using um, code to, to define the environment. Um, Kubernetes pretty much from day one has this idea of services and this concept of load balances everywhere. So rather than having um, a load balancer just to front your web servers um, and then distributing traffic, not really the distributing traffic in any other way behind those web servers. The idea with load balancers or services as they are with the Kubernetes is to deploy them between everything, to put them in front of the pods that define your application. And they're really simple to kind of set up and manipulate um, uh, services of Kubernetes, but that gives them a lot of power. So they, they use label selectors and they look at pods with certain labels. So that can be app one or version or dev and then it will just build a service so as you add and scale out pods as long as you add the the labels to those pods they will then instantly become available um, as part of that service um, and so that allows things to be highly scalable because you're enforcing that kind of immutable infrastructure and you're putting services in between everything uh, you can scale things up and down without having to rely on communicating where that traffic may now need to go um, between different applications uh, in the environment. As long as they talk to the services, then the service will aggregate that traffic for you. Um, and Kubernetes is, is, is pretty portable, really. So um, you can deploy Kubernetes, whether it's natively on, on uh, a cloud provider or whether it's on-prem. Um, and a lot of these services then just add things on top. And you need to be aware of the services and add-ons you're, you're adding in to see if you are adding something that um, becomes more proprietary or may limit whether services where you're doing, to, where you, what you may be able to use in the future. But this idea that containers can run anywhere, um, now you've got Kubernetes as a, as a scheduler or a container orchestration platform can pretty much run those containers anywhere, as opposed to uh, a vSphere environment and VMs, which really can only run without having to do some kind of import, export, and some, um, some manipulation, really can only run in a VMware environment. There's somewhere that's going to run a VMDK and understand a VM, or if you've got Hyper-V or Zen or, the, or KVM, the, those are separate kind of units of compute, whereas as a container um, running with Kubernetes, you you can deploy that anywhere. And I think this is, again, as an answer, as a as an administrator about how you might do something like um, multi-cloud, this actually gives you an idea of how you you might actually stay on top of that and be able to to answer that request that comes down from on high for needing something that's that um, can run across multiple clouds in a way that you could actually feel that you might manage. So um, yeah, so kind of perhaps I'd hope that's got you all excited about Kubernetes. So um, what would be the the next areas to look at? Where would you sort of start learning about Kubernetes? Um, so one of the projects within the Kubernetes um, organization is uh, Minikube. This will use either Hyper-V on a Windows laptop or um, uh, uses VirtualBox. Um, will spin you up 
a Kubernetes environment all within a single VM and then can configure that kube control uh, command line interface into that cluster uh, running locally a very quick way to get kubernetes um, spun up and running uh, so that you can start to poke around at it um, an even quicker way if you've got online access is to use catacoda it's an amazing service to just jump straight in go to that website and you literally get a console straight away that you can start interacting with uh, kubernetes and looking at these these idea of deploying pods and the uh, command line and services deployments and all sorts of things like replica sets things that i haven't even touched on very quick way to start playing around with them um, an interesting development for docker uh, so docker for windows um, if you switch to the edge version rather the stable version if you've got docker deployed locally uh, on your laptop that will give you an option to enable kubernetes and so that will spin up another vm locally and give you a kubernetes option or uh, kubernetes running locally again on your laptop so if you've already got docker and you just uh, locally and you just want to have a play um, you can just uh, enable that and have a play with that if you have a look at google google's kubernetes engine um, they've been running this um, on their cloud, I think pretty much since 2015 when Kubernetes came out. Um, so it's very mature, very easy to spin things up, very quick uh, onboarding process. Um, so that's a good place to start if you want to look at um, something uh, without having to try and do things uh, necessarily on prem. Um, there is a certification you can get, which is the Kubernetes um, certified administrator. And um, the Linux Foundation have uh, teamed up with edX and you can run through this course. It's really useful, really good. Um, it uses Minikube um, to, to run through the various different concepts. And that's a really good way, I think, to just do some um, self-paced learning. And uh, just touching on what I said earlier on a vSphere environment or, or GKE um, to, or, or GCP actually, to learn uh, Kubernetes from scratch. Um, so I think, as I say, I think this is a good way to understand all the underlying components, what some of these tools are doing for you. Um, you can go and have a look at these links. Um, I'll put these up on my blog. Um, this is how to deploy Kubernetes pretty much from the ground up and all the individual components. So that's a good way to kind of learn and, and probably do once um, to understand the different components and what's going on. Um, and then just to kind of completely overload you with, uh, with links, uh, a bit of further reading or further listening. Um, uh, Google have just launched, uh, I think they're on episode six or seven, a uh, really um, uh, well-produced and informative, um, nice and short podcast. Um, there, as I say, I think they're up to episode six or seven, comes out weekly, really good news of what's going on and then touching different areas. I think they've talked about documentation in the Kubernetes environment. They've talked about um, security, and really, really worth listening to, I think. Um, like all good um, projects these days, there's a number of ways you can inter interact um, with uh, people in this uh, community on Slack. Um, so jump into the Kubernetes uh, Slack workspace. There's a channel there um, for the guys working on VMware components. So it's good to see what's going on there. Um, and also um, if you jump into the VMware code, Slack workspace is a Kubernetes um, uh, channel there. Um, have a poke around in the Kubernetes docs. Uh, there's some really, there's lots of good documentation there. Lots of good, uh, really, really rich there. Um, uh, AWS have some really good workshops talking about some different paths, whether you're a developer or an operator, to work through um, some self-paced learning as well. A couple of good books. Uh, so up and running by Kelsey Hightower, who does the um, uh, the, the Kubernetes, the, the hard way piece that I was talking about earlier, um, and Brendan Burns and Joe Bader, they, these guys, the last two guys actually were some of the initial developers for Kubernetes, so really good resource. Um, have a look at Nigel Poulton's book on Kubernetes, and also he has a course on Pluralsight, which is well worth looking through. It's a couple of hours, really good to get up to speed. Uh, the Kubernetes book, um, I'd recommend buying both of these on um, Kindle, because I think then you get the updates. You certainly do with Nigel's book, and uh, I think that book is only about six pounds, so um, so well worth jumping in, um, not a lot of investment. And I think with that, um, that 
that's the the end so uh, hopefully that was useful uh, certainly I, i've been looking at it it's a very rapidly evolving and very exciting place but i think if you you can see some of the really um large deployments of people using this in production so it's definitely the right time to be involved but there's a lot changing so i think um you you can have a discussion with development teams and operations teams and uh, and um, very quickly get up to speed and, and go toe to toe with those guys uh, and be also able to and offer a service fairly quickly on prem i definitely recommend having a look at cube admin and rancher as well both both free to download and both um very straightforward to get a kubernetes cluster up and running on a vSphere environment and then if you're looking at more enterprise deployments maybe uh, uh then look at pks there's a i haven't linked to them actually here but there's some really good blogs from uh from Cormac and, and, and William Lamb um about how to get pks up and running in the lab and, and i think William Lamb's also got um one of his uh, lab scripts to deploy that for you so in my learning I haven't quite got to the PKS piece yet I've started um, downloading the pieces I've been focusing on some of the other bits at the moment but that that's the next thing for me if you so just yeah wanna, cool thank you for having me on if you just want to take it for a quick spin since a couple of weeks we also have a PKS lab in the VMware hands-on labs yeah yeah true okay perfect thank you very much Chris for presenting um at this point in time i don't think we have any questions from the audience and if you ever want to present again or uh, feel free to get in touch i'm more than happy to host you again cool thanks for having me on thank you and have a nice evening bye-bye thanks bye, -bye. Yes, thanks. bye.